My name is John Halcyon Stin. Welcome. It is such a treat to have this time to recalibrate and share this moment with you. Today's topic is my black history. So let me give a little background or explain what I mean. As I've been listening to the news recently and watching people's face posts and trying to get a handle on what's going on with race relations and police brutality, it's been very clear to me that I am not an authority in these areas and I need to tread lightly in sharing opinions on things that I know nothing about. But I have been living in the United States for decades and I do have opinions and reactions to things and so I share from this recognition that as a white man I have a very limited skewed perception of what is going on in our country and the world and so my perspective is from that awareness. I was raised with a rather optimistic view about civil rights and race relations. I had a photograph of my grandfather working with Martin Luther King Jr. And it was a huge influential part of my growing up, just knowing that and seeing my grandfather, this person that, you know, gave me gifts at Christmas time, also connected with Martin Luther King Jr. And one thing that it did do is it it made me see civil rights as something that was in the past. The photograph was black and white. And it also made me feel like just because of my lineage, I was like one of the good guys. And then growing up, I started to have more and more interactions with a world that wasn't so isolated as my house and my neighborhood. In junior high and high school, we had integration where we had kids that were bused from the other side of town to the schools on our side of town, our side of town. And it was tense, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I'm grateful for, for the experience, but there was a lot of tension, and I remember being afraid a number of times. I was never actually hit or assaulted, but I definitely was intimidated a number of times. And it made for, I went from having ignorance to actually starting to have some experiences and interactions that were not that positive. But that got a little better once we got to high school, because in high school we had sports. And so you, I, had, I had peers that I would meet through team playing, and there's something about you know when you're like running forever together and you're sweating and you're really like getting broken down and pushed to your limits, there's a camaraderie. And there's another camaraderie that forms when you have a common enemy. And it didn't matter what color your skin was, we all hated the La Jolla Vikings. And it was during that experience, during that time, that I got introduced to rap music. There was a, a workout room, and I remember these guys on the football team bringing in these mixtapes, and I was like, what? I remember hearing NWA and just being like, that's my jam! Now, if you don't know NWA, um, uh, it's ends with attitude is what that stands for, so it was not my jam. But I loved it. Oh my gosh. I got so I got a little obsessed about rap music. I would go to Tower Records and go through the twelve inches and buy anything that said like MC something on it or DJ. And I was just like and I got so much trash. But I was so hungry to be a part of this music that I couldn't hear anywhere else. I even had a radio show on our uh, school lawn area. Every Friday I would play music. And so I had my my mullet and my feelers. And, uh, and my Volvo station wagon, beige of course, that I would bump um, my tapes that I would get uh, at the swap meet, my counterfeit Run DMC tapes and, and the like. And through rap, I started listening to like uh, Boogie Down Productions, KRS-One, and uh, started to be exposed to names and ideas that I hadn't heard about. And I started to read bi autobiography of Malcolm X. I started to read about the Black Panthers. I started doing reports in school about Black Panthers. And, and 
really became somewhat of an activist for you know racial rights and I mean I even went to a, uh, a Louis Farrakhan rally at one point I mean it, uh, that's a story for another day it, I went to tons of rap concerts saw NWA saw LL Cool J saw um, just a ton and I, I always felt like yeah this I'm not I'm an outsider but I'm a you know, it was very kind of civil, and I, I kind of felt like, oh, you, you appreciate this? Well, well, then, you know, come on in. That's how I felt, um, except for one concert, which was Public Enemy. When I saw Public Enemy play, I'd never heard of them before. Um, this was before uh, they were in a, a Spike Lee movie, and um, and they started whipping the crowd into a chant of Fight the Power, and the, several people sitting around me started to make it very clear with their gestures and bumping that, I was the target, or I represented the target of a lot of this anger. But other than that, it was a fairly balanced and civil, and I always felt comfortable. And then the after the Rodney King riots happened, and that kind of changed everything, at least in the way that I felt. And and it, it kind of it became clear to me that the anger and the frustration was way deeper than. I realized, and it was going to take more than some some clever rhymes to fix things. And I also started to learn that sometimes it's not that helpful to try to help people. Sometimes it's actually kind of disrespectful, and you know, me wearing. A Malcolm X t-shirt isn't supporting the cause it's kind of offensive and so I didn't know what to do you know I recognize that that I agreed with this the things I'm hearing in this music I'm agreeing with the things I'm reading but I'm also feeling like I don't know where my place in this is how can I I, I honor and make space I mean that's I guess all I can do is try to make space and encourage um, a call it out when I hear people saying things that are, you know, racist or, um, or, or trying to create an environment where people can have self-growth regardless of what their background is. And I kind of like went into the, kind of like just like pulled back and, and, and said that's not my fight. You know, I if called upon, if asked, if I can vote in some way, like I'm sure there's some subconscious thing, like yeah, hey, I can vote for Obama and, and do a little bit more, do my part. But there is, there was mostly the feeling of like I need to step back and and support the cause, but not fight the be in the battle. It's not my battle, and and that because kind of my stance for the last whatever two decades and this last couple weeks has really shook me as I've been putting myself in the shoes of a young black man trying to imagine what it would feel like to hear some of these grand jury announcements and trying to understand the depth of frustration and 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 realizing as I hear stories being shared and as more and more people share their experiences that this isn't this isn't something that happened this week this is the shit that people of color have to deal with and have had to deal with every day for as long as they've been alive And it's not, well, they got to work a little harder. Well, you know, their bootstraps may stick a little bit, but they can lift them up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, well, you can just, maybe it's a little bit harder, but, you know, all, they have all the same opportunities. Yeah, but, but what about the fear? I go through my life, and I am never afraid 
that someone in authority is going to hurt me. I know that even if I'm a little uppity and I you know, talk back to a police officer, probably the worst that's going to happen is I'm going to get detained for longer or I'm going to get a ticket or there's nothing that I, that I couldn't talk myself out of. No, don't get me wrong. I am a, a I am super uh, conflict avoidance when it comes to authority and police. I've had a, a, a few interactions in my life where I've had to go through my script that I've perfected, where it's like, "No, officer, no, no, no. I'm, yeah, you're right, officer. You're yo, ah, you are so smart, officer. I am so dumb. Thank you, officer. Thank you for yes. Thank you, officer. I'm sorry. Let me. I will get out of your way. Sorry. Thank you, officer." Because the risk of being confrontational is too strong. But granted, I can do that from this place of white privilege, from this place of knowing that if something happened to me, there would be an uproar and there would be lawsuits and I could sue and I would feel like I could have consequences if I had to stand up for myself. But to be a young black man and see these headlines and feel like, whoa, nothing's going to happen. I do not have the law or my rights to, to fall back on. And what would that do? And I find myself feeling like, I don't know what to do now. This is all the stuff that was getting me riled up when I was in high school. And just like then, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. <sighs> to the point that I'm finding myself like feeling very fragile and easily frustrated and I'm finding some things that I know some I'm, I'm having to like watch old hug nation videos and watch old read things that I've written to try to like get me back on track I, for, this weekend was first Saturday is our homeless outreach and I never think about race when we do that I never think well, partially because it's very mixed you know we've got there's all different types that find themselves um, in Skid Row of San Diego. But I found myself like with these attaching stories and scenarios and like, well, like how much easier it would be to get in the situation for that guy than that guy? How many more chances does that guy with the white skin have to get out of this, to get a break versus that guy? And I started to like it just feel so guilty and feel And I realized that this is the same trap that I fell into long ago where I felt like fighting the darkness is just too hard. And so I really, I, I try to just like go back <laughs> to like the most basic mantra that I have of like be present, have integrity, align with love. And try to go back to what like the basics of First Saturdays is, which is not like trying to end homelessness, but instead just trying to just be present and show kindness for somebody. Try to do something nice, and if we have extra stuff, share it with somebody who has less. Not get too caught up in their story, not get too caught up in where they should be or where they need to be, but just where are you now and how can I make that a little bit lighter? Because that's the only framework that I can have where I don't get overwhelmed. And I have a faith, I'll admit it's shaky right now, but I do have faith that when you do that and you get present and you realign with love and then you make choices from that place, not from a change the world, but just from like what is right in this moment, that will have effects in the world, that will ripple, that will be the change. <sighs> Even if it feels like the amount of change needed is so daunting. But there was one thing that happened this weekend that I am I'm just keep returning to and keep returning to and keep returning to and keep returning to. This one cone. First of all, it was a it was a incredibly probably the most volunteers we've ever had at first Saturday. It's 140, 150 people. It was packed. Which makes it a little hard as the organizer to help everybody feel like they have something to do when there's just so many volunteers. But it's inspiring. There's that many people that came out because they want to define themselves. They see themselves as helpers. They want to have opportunities to be of service. And so that was inspiring first off. But then 
and we had so much donations too. Oh my gosh, it was like I was actually crying <laughs> right when the event started. I was looking at these mountains of stuff that people were just kept bringing it and kept bringing it. And then, um, and then there's Ray. Ray is a, I believe, a nine-year-old boy who has been very active in First Saturdays the last many months. And he's super enthusiastic, and he shares ideas, and he works hard, and he's got a huge smile, and he's something special. And before we, we organize the clothes, and then we go and we go to a different area, and we, we hand it out. But, but after we organize the clothes, we have a little circle called the Circle of Love. And I talk about what we're going to do, and what our vision is, and why we're doing it. And we pass the hat around if people want to contribute towards the care packs. And Ray hands me an envelope. And Ray, nine years old, decided that for his birthday, he told his family and he told his neighbors and he told his friends that instead of presents, he would like people to give that money as a donation that he could give to First Saturdays and help the homeless. Not Legos, not iPad games. And so he handed me an envelope with $217 with jingling change and bills and personal checks. And I just was like, I gave him this hug and I just like didn't want to let go. I was like... <sighs> needed to see this right now. I think we all needed to see it, you know? And then he also brought, he told his mom he wanted to bring cupcakes to give to the homeless, so they brought 200 cupcakes to give away to the needy. Listen to what's going on, and I look at the world, and, I, and there's so much crap, and there's so much darkness, and there's so much pain. And then I remember that there is a cone, and there are rays. There are rays of light like ray. The world is dark. And the world is broken. And the world is perfect and filled with magic. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. I love you. Special thank you to Ray and the millions of people that do kind acts, not for the $217, but for the rippling effects that that, the unknown rippling effects. I've been touched by that little boy this week so deeply in a week when I really felt lost and I don't know if he knows so we all need to keep getting present Aligning with love.
and then acting from that place. And we can be rays of light and have rippling effects that we will never see. That I do believe. So thank you for the rays that you shine. I love you. Let's have a hug. Grab yourself by the shoulders. And the shoulders we hold are of our physical body that goes through the physical world, world with all sorts of physical obstacles and ideological obstacles, but let's just hug now the deeper part of ourself, the inner heart, the shining light, free from ideology, free from thought, just pure energy, pure love that is at our core, that shines through us like it shines through everyone. And let's just take three breaths, shining, breathing from that place, in through the nose, out through the mouth. On behalf of Grandpa Caleb, nine-year-old Ray, and all the love warriors, happy hug nation. Thank you. Namaste. Myself, I did a um, donation for First Saturdays. I asked people to do clothes, um, money, basically anything that they had that was like extra. And how much did you did you collect? I, I collected um today two hundred and seventeen dollars. <laughs>